Hello, listeners. This is Kat. Welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of Throw a Chair Through a Window and Call It a Day. This will be Part 3, Chapter 3, entitled... Okay, so like, you know how everyone hates us? Well... Izuka stared at his notebook, the one he was still writing in, by the way. Eyes always since they wanted him to write down all the problems he could find with Yue, and unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for now, there was quite a lot. It was going to be a bit of a challenge to accomplish these before next Monday, but if they worked hard... He's sure they could do it. His teacher, plopping down into Nezu's, or is it his now, lush leather chair and propping his feet up on the desk, snapped Izuku out of his inspirational thought process. The gruff man took one look at the boy's notebook and sighed, but something about the way he did it made him sound almost fond. But that couldn't be right, right? Why would his teacher ever be happy about more work? And yesterday, Izuku swore he'd heard the man snort at something he had said, but his teacher never laughs either. It's only been a day, and Aizawa-sensei is already acting much different than usual, although, to be fair, Izuka could be considered to be the exact same. He growled at Kachan, even glared at him today, even though it was purely for scientific purposes, and he called out a teacher for his stupidity. Overall, he doesn't know how he's alive right now, or dead, but it was a welcome change. What's wrong with a little confidence? He was going to need it if he wanted to be the new symbol of peace. Yeah, it was to be the new symbol of peace. When I said not to hold back on Yue's list of issues, I didn't think you'd go that far, Aizawa-sensei said, emphasizing his words. How many's on there? Twenty? Thirty? Thirty-eight. His teacher let out a long whistle, and Izuku immediately backtracked, flushing in embarrassment and waving his arms around. I mean, of course they're all, like, really minor, just stuff I've noticed during my time here, but then again, that isn't a lot. Only one and a half years. I'm not even a third year yet. These probably won't change much around here anyway. Sorry about that. I think I got a little too caught up in the smaller things for the greater good. I should have known it was just an expression and not meant to be taken seriously. Midoriya, his teacher cut in sternly, and Izuka halted in the middle of his rambling. No problem is too small when it comes to UA. Everything here matters. And knowing you, it'll probably change a lot. Izuka didn't entirely know what his teacher meant by that, but it didn't sound like an insult, so he stayed silent. It's better we handle it now than watch it snowball and blow up in our faces later. Although Izuku was still a little unsure, he nodded. If his teacher chose to acknowledge everything he wrote down, then that must mean it had some value to it, right? He hoped so. So, Izuku started quietly, still confused as to how he was supposed to react to the... encouragement? Praise? He didn't know what it was, but it certainly couldn't be that. His teacher rarely ever bluntly praises people. Sports festival for general education, or connections? Both. If I have to meet with Power Loader, I'd rather we get it all done at once instead of dragging it out to two meetings. Plus, there's another problem you didn't write down yet, about the sports festival that I plan on having another vote for. Wow, three changes at once. And he thought yesterday was a lot. He's not complaining, though. More changes equal more plans. And by God, does he like making plans. Especially since it appears that Aizawa Sensei gave him permission to do more slight emotional manipulation. Although, when his teacher said those exact words, he started holding back laughter again. And Izuka doesn't know if he should be worried about why he's laughing at the term or the fact that he's laughing in general. Wait, Izuka muttered. What's the second vote for? Shota stared at the fresh pot of coffee, once again drawn to the deep pool of bitter liquid that would scorch his tongue as he drank from his mug. Except this time, there were two mugs. One was white and filled with plain black coffee, and the other was exactly the same if you ignore the countless sugar packets dumped in and the way too much cream. Bye now. One can probably guess which belonged to Midoriya. He sat in Nezu's chair, just like he had during his meeting with Namuri yesterday. As Midoriya sat in the smaller chair on the left side of the desk, the sound of the boy's unending scribbling in his notebook could have lulled him to sleep, and for a second he almost forgot the real reason they were in here. Come on, Aizawa, the pot's right there, Power Loader whined, gesturing toward the sacred object as he sat parallel to Shota. Can I please just pour myself one cup, just one? The pro-hero was practically begging at this point, and while Midoriya may have shown sympathy, Shota has none. Where was that poor-myself attitude yesterday when you asked my secretary to get you coffee? He heard Midoriya choke on his drink. Power loader, known to the rest of the staff as Majima, deflated and slumped in his seat. Shota smirked. Serves him right for being an ignorant ass. Even if his green-haired student hadn't been offended, it sure as hell wasn't right, and the grumpy man wasn't going to let those kinds of questions pass as long as he had something to say about it. Precisely. Fine. 
But can you at least tell me why you called me here? Because I have a feeling it wasn't just to call me out on the coffee comment. Majima huffed, but still looked a little nervous. Once again, good. Yesterday it was Kayama, and today it's me. Are you planning on singling out one of us every morning for the next week? Because that's what it's starting to look like. No, he wasn't. But if that's what the others were thinking, then he wasn't going to step in. Intimidation techniques weren't limited to just glaring, after all. Shota quirked an eyebrow in interest. He should probably tell Midoriya to write that down later, as well as give him a few more examples of intimidation to try out. Not only would it be helpful for the kid's future career as a pro hero, but it would be amusing as hell. And he knew the boy would listen to him, too. During Class 2A's homeroom this morning, he'd walked in only to see the entire room stuck in chilling silence, the only sound coming from his forest-eyed student as he happily scribbled in his notebook with a smile. Every other one of his students was pale as a sheet of paper and had the most haunted looks on their faces. While it may have been a confusing sight to everyone else, it took Shota only three seconds to understand what had occurred. Midoriya listened to his advice and ran a few more trials to test out his glaring skills, no doubt getting his ideal reaction results. And that's not even the best part, no. It was Bakugo that really topped it off. Shota isn't one to be petty if he doesn't have a reason, so thank God he has a reason. Don't get him wrong, it's nothing personal. But he's not the one that gets yelled at every day just for speaking by a blonde with anger issues. He should really discuss that issue later on. That's Midoriya. And everyone knows that Midoriya isn't one to hold a grudge, let alone take action because of it. Although yesterday's interaction with Vlad had been questioning that fact. But the kids' little rivalry has gone too far. It would do more harm than good for Shota to step in himself, so all he did was give his oblivious student a step in the right, or he guessed, petty direction. He thought it would teach him a valuable lesson about picking and choosing his battles. And my god, it definitely did. Bakugo looked like he had seen a ghost, in by far the worst shape among his classmates, opening and closing his mouth, finger shaking as he pointed to Midoriya, then himself, then Midoriya, then himself, and then just repeated that entire process all over again. Kirishima tried to comfort him, but there wasn't much he could do when he was just as scared. It made him wish he was there to see it all go down, but he guessed he could settle for this. And besides, after the voting process yesterday, he realized that Nezu planted security cameras in almost every office and classroom, so now he could just make the security feed of Midoriya his screensaver and the audio of Vlad getting roasted his ringtone. It was the best morning he'd had in a while, but back to the conversation. It's about our... Majima lifted his eyebrows at the word hour for some reason, and Shota suddenly felt like he was the confused one in the room now. Second course of action. Damn, Aizawa. Starting your second project already? Majima lifted his fist to his chest and opened his mouth, ready to speak, but Shota cut him off before he could utter a single word. Respect, I know. The underground hero rolled his eyes at his co-worker's antics. It was Kirishima's manly situation all over again, and he'll be damned if he has to deal with two of them. Not to mention Tetsu Tetsu. What does it have to do with me specifically, though? The plan, or I guess plans, there's multiple, directly affects the support course students as well as your job, so... Shota stopped short as he saw Majima wearing a fearful expression on his face. What? Are... are you firing me? He... Jesus Christ. No, Majima, I'm not going to fire you. The hell did you get that idea from? Nezu might have given him the go-ahead to teach his class as he pleased and expel who he saw fit, but that sure as hell didn't apply to his co-workers, and besides, Shota sticks to his word. He won't be petty if he doesn't have a reason to be. Nezu gave you complete power as principal. You expelled your entire class two years ago. Last week I spilled coffee on your sleeping bag and didn't wash it out. That was you. And you and your secretary destroyed Vlad yesterday and made Midnight walk out of this office looking like death itself. You two are practically bulldozing through this school, and I thought I was your next target to run over. Aizawa pinched the bridge of his nose with both index fingers, inhaling and exhaling deeply, to try and keep his bubbling rage from exploding. Contrary to popular belief, he does take good care of himself. He keeps up with daily personal hygiene, he gets at least some sleep every day, he always has proper calorie intake, and he washes his belongings to keep them clean. Personal belongings such as his yellow sleeping bag, and yeah... It wasn't that hard to wash out the coffee stain, but that didn't mean he enjoyed the midday surprise the hot liquid left for him when he tried taking a nap. Now he really does have a reason to be petty to Majima, but he's nothing if not tolerant. Midoriya. He breathed out, not even bothering to do the snapping gesture that he'd grown so fond of in only a single day. Explain the first plan to Power Loader before I really do hit him with my car. The child gave a nod of understanding 
since when does he understand the urge to hit people with a car? Eh, whatever, either way, he agrees, and continued without question. The first plan is actually quite minor on your part, but it could possibly help a lot of students. During the annual UA Sports Festival, almost every course has a specialty or role. The HERO course has advanced training in combat and quirk use. The support course is able to bring support items as long as they design and construct them by themselves, and the business department can use this as an opportunity to scout future members of their agencies or for their legal dealings. But general education has none of these roles or advantages, and as all those students said, they're pretty much just there to make the HERO students look good. Of course, a lot of them are trying to get into the hero course, but there's only ever one spot available, and it would be cruel to suggest that everyone wants to be heroes anyway, so much so that they would want to get out of Jeanette as fast as possible. So they would need other goals that don't insult their school course in order to have a good time and stay motivated. Therefore, we were hoping you could help give them a chance to have a role or just a real shot in general. How long, on average, do you think it would take for one of your students to build a few functioning support items? Midoriya asked, before adding one more comment. Oh, and please don't include May in that average. Ah, uh, yes, a very reasonable request. Majima thought it over a bit before answering. About a week, give or take, since they only get about an hour a day to work on personal projects. Good. Then starting next year, would you consider leaving your lab open for about an hour each day for a week after school for some other students to come in and develop their items? As soon as Midori asked his question, Majima's fearful anticipation was gone. Now it's just fear. You're kidding, right? Shota rolled his eyes. What is it with his co-workers and thinking he's kidding? Does he honestly look like the type of person to tell a joke, let alone laugh at anything? Yesterday excluded. Hatsume's a support course genius, and she still blows up the lab every other day. Can you imagine what an inexperienced student could do? Unfortunately, yes, but that's where you'd come in. May doesn't allow anyone to monitor a project's development, because she thinks it dilutes her creative genius, but she's pretty unique. With these other students, you can make it a requirement for them to allow you to overlook their progress and work. That way you can verify their safety. Also, they wouldn't be completely inexperienced. Another requirement we were thinking of adding is making any student that wants to design a support item for sports festival use fill out an assessment to see if they have enough knowledge and experience about the topic before being allowed to work. If you deem them unfit, then you don't have to let them in. In the end, it's all up to you since you could decide how many and which students can be in the lab after school. Midori finished, explaining the first plan to Majima, looking hopeful. So, would you be willing to do it then? Majima still looked a little unsure, but after hearing all the precautions they came up with, a lot more open to the idea. Finally, after thinking it over and getting puppy eyes from Midoriya. Shota swears those are lethal weapons. It's never been used on him before, but he saw the effects it had on Shoji once. He gave in. Ah, okay, you got me. Can't say no to those eyes. Midoriya tilted his head in confusion. You're only proving his point, Shota thought in fond exasperation. But on one condition. I get the final say on whether or not their product is good to go. I don't do this with my own students, but that's because I know for a fact they can handle themselves. With these kids, if there's even the slightest chance of failure in their items, I'll be forced to reject them. But if it's safe, I'll give my stamp of approval. Can't be too safe, you know. I don't want these kids getting injured on my watch. And just like that, Shota saw Majima in a new light. His co-worker was childish and valued humor above his own paycheck, but he was responsible. The guy's been a hero for years. He's seen how badly civilians and heroes alike can get injured in freak accidents, and he doesn't want the same thing to happen in a school where kids are supposed to feel safe and protected. He may talk like a server, but this is something that Shota would always respect him for, especially after the USJ disaster last year. Of course! Midoriya's cheery voice brought him out of his mind before he could continue down that train of thought. Majima released a breath that nobody knew he was holding, his relief palpable for some reason. Oh, thank God. I was worried you were going to go all Aizawa on me like you did with Vlad. Did did he just use Shota's name? And to describe an action his student did, what exactly was Majima suggesting? Huh? The green-haired child asked. What do you... Anyway, Shota was not letting the kid continue that thought. He might not have known what it meant, but judging by Majima's stupidly smug smile, it must be annoying enough for Shota to want to avoid. On to the second change. Problem child, if you will. Right. So it's known worldwide that UA offers multiple courses, hero support, business in general. But even though they're all in the same building, they're mostly kept separate. And unfortunately, this leads to a lot of bad blood between the departments. Just last year, a lot of students were pissed at us first years in heroics because all the constant villain attacks were annoying them. The problem was only solved after everyone got to know each other in the sports festival. 
But school festivals only happen once a year. Meanwhile, the departments could get into heated battles with each other at any time and have no means of working through them. Just the other day I saw Ayano from business throw a banana peel at Monoma. He deserved it, but that's not the point. In a few years, all the departments are going to be working together as professionals. Here, students need to be scouted by pros and business students working at agencies. Support technicians need to be hired by said hero students for equipment. And gen ed students are just full of wild cards for potentially great connections to have. But none of them are going to be happy about that if they all despise each other. Keeping them separate and unable to interact and personally understand one another is just setting them up for failure in the future. Therefore, the kid gave a dramatic pause as he whipped out a piece of paper that had an interior design remodeling of the cafeteria on it. Yesterday during lunch, I made a few observations about the atmosphere in the cafeteria. Something I've just noticed is that even though we all have the same lunch periods, departments are kept separate by a bunch of retractable barrier posts. In order to merge the sitting area together to get all of them to interact, I thought about just removing the barricades, but then I realized that'd never work. Majima cut into Midori's explanation. Huh? Why not? Ah, might as well give the kids some breathing time and answer the question for him. Once teenagers find a group of friends and a table to sit at, they tend to stick to that area for the next three years. Barriers won't change a thing. Majima gave a weird look, as if wondering why he knew that. What? He was a teenager once, too, despite apparent popular belief from his class. Mm-hmm. So, the only other option is to literally force them to move to the same area. Students are possessive of their seating areas. They don't want to sit anywhere other than the table they're used to. If you sit in their seat without permission, they'll most likely kick you out. Or just use their quirk to shove you off. Midoriya muttered that last part, but showed his training as an underground hero has allowed him to hear even the faintest of sounds. He knows for a fact... Nobody has ever used their quirk to fend someone off from their chair. Sure, they might have politely asked them to move, but quirk usage outside of heroics is strictly prohibited. What kind of school did Midoriya go to that let their students mercilessly run wild like that? It was something Shota would have to save for later, though, because the green-eyed child perked back up from his brief, solemn state to continue his rant. Therefore, I suggest we just scatter the arrangement of the tables, and they'll know we did it since they all have numbers on them. The preparation isn't complicated at all. It's their reactions to it that matter. I've made sure to keep certain groups separate, since they may cause more problems in close proximity to each other, and I put others together that I think could get along, or at least have a mutual understanding. For example, the Baku Squad. The what? They have group names now. And Monoma are as far away as possible, along with all of Monoma's friends. Ida is out of May's range, since he's still a little salty about last year's festival, and Shinso and Ojiro are separate for the exact same reasons, however... There are also examples of friendly relationships. Kendo is close to Monoma, to drag him away from bothering others, and she's also close to Momo since they have a nice rivalry going on. Yes, that's a perfectly healthy example of a rivalry. Take notes, Midoriya. Kirishima and Tetsutetsu, they're clones. Tokiyami and Kororo, over their mutual love of darkness. Ayano and Ashido, Rumiko and Mei. Mafuyu and Hagakure, and so on. Hopefully with this, they'll build a few friendships and make promises to work together after graduation. This bushy-haired student paused a bit before continuing. Or just tolerate each other in general. Huh. Mashima flipped through the paper that now rested in his hands. Well, you've certainly thought this through, but aren't you worried about all the confusion this is going to cause as soon as lunch starts? Shota's eyes darkened, and to all of their surprise, so did Midoriya's. The black-haired man opened his mouth to reply. Yes, actually, very. But it's a risk we're going to have to take if we want a positive outcome in the end. I only hope that they keep property damage to a minimum, he sighed. Property damage? Bakugo. One word is all it took for the support hero to immediately understand. Perking up, his cheery student spoke. That reminds me. I've already asked Sementa sensei to start moving around the table, so we don't need your help in that department, but you do have a big role in this. So small, yet so big. And what's that? Prevent May from testing out her inventions on other students during lunch. Shota's not going to lie. That's probably one of the hardest jobs in this school. Hatsume isn't even one of his students, but she might as well be, given how much stress she gives him. Last week, she upgraded Bakugo's grenades, which then proceeded to malfunction and destroy half of a building in training ground beta. And the girl didn't even bat an eye at the destruction she caused, only pouting at her baby before cackling madly and then running to her lab to improve them. He has no problem with the mad cackling. He just hates what comes after, and the sleep he loses because of it. There's no doubt in the erasure hero's mind that, given the chance, she'll make grenades for everyone in that cafeteria. Majima didn't seem to be faring too well either, since he's had to deal with her every weekday 
since last year. The principal and secretary duo just hoped the man wouldn't accidentally get himself blown up in 30 minutes. But let's be honest, that was never an option to begin with. Izuku dug his teeth into the shiny red apple as he stared across the cafeteria, savoring the taste of the juice and the crisp crunch sound it made. Lunch Rush had also offered Aizawa Sensei an apple, but he opted to go for another one of his juice pouches today. He always thought those things would have tasted like, well, nothing, just flavorless gray mush that served no other purpose than to keep a person healthy. Because that was the kind of person he'd always seen Aizawa Sensei as. A person who gets nothing but basic necessities and does nothing than basic necessities. His office desk was devoid of any personal items. He only slept for the minimum requirement of hours and, of course, digests nothing but juice pouches, water, and coffee. But one look at the front of the pouch, the words Mango Edition written across it, had him second-guessing everything he thought he knew. Oh, so you're trying to merge the departments together during lunch period? Aizawa Sensei paused in his slurping to glance at the lunch hero. Mm-hmm. And then he went right back to slurping. Nice. I always love it when new friendships are born. Izuku heard a dreamy sigh through the hero's mask. Hope the arrangement was thought out, though. It'd be a shame if this whole mixer... His grumpy teacher mumbled out a quick, Mixer? Was ruined because a few students decided to have a squabble. The hero in training flashed a bright smile. We did. I made sure to match them up based on personality traits, reasons for choosing the academic path they did, hobbies, whether they think the dress is black and blue or white and gold. Favorite, Izuku was cut off by a loud yet nervous laugh. Well, aren't you a thorough bunch? Unfortunately, there are some occasions when great friendships can cause great problems. The chef said with a sigh, oblivious to the panic he had just caused. Izuku and his teacher turned to share a look with each other, eyes wide in fear of what that statement implied. Wasting no time, the green-haired child turned to the chef. What problems? Which friendships? He was just about restraining himself from shaking the older man's shoulders to get an answer out of him, but he figured it would be perfectly justified. Just the slightest mishap in the next 45 minutes could cause everything to come tumbling down. He had to destroy this hypothetical problem before it got the chance to plant its seed. Huh? Oh, Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu. I love their dynamic, but Jesus Christ. The others' reactions are a pain to deal with. What? Izuku yelled, because that's absurd. Those two are amazing together. Their quirks are similar. They both love the word manly. They both intern for fourth kind. Hell, they even have the same teeth. How could that bond lead to anything but the manliest? Oh God, that word is officially ingrained itself in his brain. Friendship in the universe. Oh, yeah, the hero stated matter-of-factly. They're so alike, they're practically clones, but that means it's basically double of every part of them. Double worshipping of Crimson Riot, double the word bro, double the manliness. The chef shivered, and that's when Izuka realized the word manly was ingrained into everyone's brain now. Personally, I think it's adorable, but I can imagine how the boys as friends might find that extremely annoying. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But at least it's their friends, right? And that means they cherish them enough to tolerate their little habits. It wouldn't cause a big enough problem to start a whole fight, right? Because what kind of psycho would resort to violence for something as simple as that? Oh. Oh. Izuka's stomach dropped and his head whipped back to face Aizawa Sensei, who seemed to have realized the exact same thing he did at the exact same time. They both knew what kind of psycho would do that. They have to deal with that psycho every morning. Kachan. The explosive blonde would no doubt resort to violence the second Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu did their new secret. It's hardly a secret anymore, given how often they do it. Handshake. He could see it now. The explosions, the fire, the property damage, everything. The one thing he and Aizawa Sensei promised to do was keep school destruction to a minimum. And look at them now. He should have known it was an impossible dream to have, but still, Izuku is nothing if not determined. There's still a way to fix this. He knows there is. All they have to do is rearrange about two to three tables, and problem solved. Sure, the tables are a bit heavy, and he might scratch the floor a bit, but there's nothing a fool cow can't handle, and... Crap. The green bean more or less heard them before he saw them. Their loud footsteps speed walking toward the cafeteria doors, and ready to burst through them and scatter at any moment. The door was about ten feet from the closest table, though, and they seemed to be about halfway down the hall to the door if his hearing was good enough to go by. He'd say they had a solid thirty seconds to fix this mess before anyone would get suspicious, and they would miss the reactions to new table placements. You take Tetsu Tetsu's table, and I'll take Bakugo's, was all he heard from his teacher before they both shot in different directions. Izuko activating full cal at the highest percentage he could handle to lift up the steel boy's table and sprint to the left. Once he was about four seating areas away from its previous spot, 
He kicked a few tables apart and shifted them down to make room for the table he was currently holding. Relieved that he completed the job, he turned to see if Aizawa Sensei was done yet, but his gaze shifted to the man just in time to see his capture weapon shoot out and wrap around the table, gripping it. His teacher then yanked on his scarf to pull the large object toward him and made contact with it just to slam it into the newly available space on the ground, far, far away from Tetsu Tetsu's spot. Holy crap! What's the tensile strength on that thing? Izuku asked, his fanboy mode activating. Scratch that. How do you even control it? Someone once told me that it was connected to your brainwaves, which I guess would explain how you're able to dictate where it goes midair, but how could carbon fibers and a metal alloy manage to pull that off? Whenever you activate your quirk, your hair floats, and maybe that's the reason your scarf does too? But does that mean it's laced with your DNA somehow? Oh my god, can you float yourself if you try hard enough? Have you had a minor telekinesis quirk this entire time and never told anybody because of underground hero secrets? Your eyes glow red to float your hair and scarf. Could you move that red light down the rest of your body and even spread it to other objects? This time, it wasn't another person that cut off his rambling. It was Izuku himself. And that's already a rare enough occurrence. The reason he cut himself off wasn't that he realized the students were still approaching. It wasn't because of embarrassment, and it wasn't because of the stunned or awed. Huh? What is he talking about? That's impossible. Look on Aizawa Sensei's face, either. It was because he had just noticed where his teacher placed Kachan's table. Uh, um, Aizawa Sensei? The hero trainee pointed a shaking finger toward him. You place Kachan's table right next to mine. And just like that, their stomachs dropped ten stories further down. Kachan and his friends couldn't sit anywhere near his table, or else it'd just be another screaming match between them that'll last the whole period. They had to move the Baku Squad's table somewhere else, and they had to do it fast. In a split second, Izuku had entered analyzing mode. Monoma was a no-go. Kachan still pissed at Mei for the malfunctioning equipment, but that's mostly because he wasn't aware of it the first time. He would gladly demand her for more grenades the first chance he got, and for the sake of power loader, he couldn't let that happen. He knows Koda and Kachan won't bother each other, but the animal hero generally didn't like loud sounds, and the Baku squad is nothing if not that. He needed someone who was quiet enough to not get on the explosive blonde's nerves, but chill enough to deal with constant memes and crackling. And that's when it hit him. The table of emos. Jiro, Shoji, and Tokiyami were the foundation of the table, with Momo making an occasional appearance from time to time to chat with Jiro. The girl with ear jacks could already be considered a member of the Baku squad. Shoji rarely ever spoke or picked arguments with people, and Tokiyami mostly minded his own business aside from talking about MCR with Jiro and speaking of darkness with anyone willing to listen. They were perfect. But the students were practically right behind the door, so he had to get this done now. Izuka sprinted to the Emos' table, kicking and shoving the objects around to make enough spare room. Finally, when he was satisfied, he turned back around to face Aizawa Sensei and held up his arms. He attempted to communicate with his eyes, and even though he knew it probably looked ridiculous, his message managed to come across. Aizawa nodded silently and activated his quirk, causing his scarf to once again float in the air and shoot forward, wrapping around the table and aiming it toward Izuku. The approaching students halted, and he heard the door creak open. It was now or never, but before the plan was put into motion, his teacher told him one thing. A wise statement that he would carry with himself into his career as a pro hero and for the rest of his life. Break a bone, and I'm disowning you. And that's when several things happened at once. First, Izuka wondered if there was an actual will he was a part of in the first place. Second, the doors burst open, revealing his entire class's confused expressions, Bakugo especially. And third, Aizawa Sensei hurled the table toward him, his scarf fiercely unraveling with a snap. The students' eyes followed the speeding table as it collided into him, fitting perfectly between his arms, and they all watched as Izuku immediately slammed the heavy object into the ground, resulting in a few spiderweb cracks to form in the ground. Ugh, property damage. Silence filled the room, and the temporary principal and secretary turned to see hundreds of teenagers staring at them with slack jaws and wide eyes. Ida looked like he didn't know if he should risk lecturing a teacher. Kirishima looked like he wanted to yell about manliness. Ashido was recording the whole thing, and Katan looked really scared for some reason. But that can't be true, because when is he ever scared? The last time he saw anything close to that was during Kamino last year, and the sludge incident the year before that, and nothing since. He was acting like he thought he was going to be slammed into the ground next, and... Now that the one-for-all user thinks about it, he looked like he had this morning when he glared at him. Oh, thank God. That all but confirms he's not scared, because when would Kachan ever be scared of him? And that's when he realized that he still had to get out of this room in one piece with Aizawa Sensei. He looked to his teacher in support and found absolutely no mercy, just a shit-eating grin as he enjoyed the boy's pain. Izuka pouted, but his mood severely brightened once he saw his teacher realize that he was also the subject of attention. 
Why are all of you just standing and staring? Oh, so he was going with the feign ignorance technique. Tactical move. He should write this down when he gets back to the office. Lunch already started. You want the food to get cold? That subtle threat sobered them up all right, and suddenly the duo were forgotten in favor of lining up for their meals, as you couldn't know whether to be relieved or insulted, but he'll settle for the former. As silently and inconspicuously as possible, Zuko and Aizawa-sensei hopped off their tables and made their way to the door, almost making it out without anyone seeing them. Almost. Right as they were about three feet from the door, Kaminari popped up in front of them with an incredulous, but highly amused expression on his face. Why were you guys here way before us? he asked, and Izuka froze. God, freezing is just more suspicious. And why does he keep acting like he's doing something illegal? Ashido popped up right beside him, as she typed on her phone. It's honestly pure luck I was already recording when I came in here. Just sent that video to the entire class. She giggled. I'm sorry, what? She sent that to the class? Why, though? Did it look more embarrassing than he had originally thought? Oh, Lord. Imagine if Kachan sees it and laughs. Imagine if Monoma sees it and laughs. He'll be destroyed. And why did Aizawa Sensei just yeet a table at you? Kaminari pressed, seemingly oblivious to Izuku's inner meltdown. Maybe the meltdown was the reason for what he did next, though not being in the right headspace and all that. Not thinking clearly enough to understand the consequences a single sentence would bring him in the future. And because of that, he shrugged and replied, The bitch was empty. Kaminari glowed. Shota thought he couldn't possibly be more disappointed in his students, and once again, he was proved wrong. It took five minutes, five goddamn minutes, of talking before he and his secretary could finally escape the iron clutches of Kaminari, Ashido, and their endless vine references, whatever that thing was. The grumpy teacher had heard things he didn't expect nor want to hear, his eyes already have chronic pain, and his students managed to give him ear pain now, too. It was a cultural reset that made him realize just how much he hated dealing with today's youth. Sixty-nine cents, Miss Keisha, Jared, burnt chicken nuggets, and so much more. All of which made absolutely no sense to him, but perfect sense to Midoriya. The green-haired kid managed to understand and reply to everything that came out of the electric blonde's mouth, was it some sort of secret language they developed when talking around adults? He didn't know. One thing he did know is that this might be the first time, but definitely won't be the last. It was only when Shota saw the other UA students' expressions morph to confusion at the new seating arrangement, and when he heard Midoriya say something along the lines of adult virgin, that he decided to step in. Shota shot out his capture weapon, making sure to cover the kid's mouth with the scarf, effectively picking up and silencing the green-eyed child. Mido, no! Come back! Kaminari yelled, dropping to his knees and clutching his heart as Ashido splashed water on his face to replicate tears. What the actual hell is wrong with his students? Is this how other classes act, or is he just eternally cursed to handle these demon spawns? Rolling his eyes, Shota dragged the floating Midori out the hallway and into the faculty office, only letting him down once he was sure the door was closed and they could no longer hear the blonde boy's shouting of memes. Work ahead. Ah, uh, yeah, I sure hope it does. The underground hero gave him an incredulous look. The very first thing you say, he breathed out. Vine! exclaimed a voice from behind them. Power Loader halted in the middle of photocopying documents to stare at them. Oh, you've got to be kidding. Chris, is that a we- No. He was not going to have a repeat of that awful experience. He inwardly smirked as Majima shivered from the intensity of his bright red gaze, slithering back to the photocopier like a snake. It was at that moment he noticed the exact documents the man was copying in the first place, the ones for Plan 3. He turned around to face Midoriya, who, by the way, looked a little downtrodden at the missed opportunity of having a horrible conversation with the support hero. Problem, child. The boy perked up, getting right back into business mode. Good. Gather all the teachers in here. I'm going to get this vote done as quickly as possible so we can observe the cafeteria, and... He snatched the stack of papers from Majima, handing them over to his student. Give them all one of these to look over. Right. The boy did a two-fingered salute and ran off to God knows where on a mission to track down all of his co-workers. How did the boy know where all of them were during their lunch break? He didn't know, and he also figured it was better if he never found out. Showed aside and plopped down his original desk chair, the one he had before becoming principal. It's only been two days, but this feels strangely foreign, which was odd considering he sat in that one for years. Maybe it's because... As soon as he got a taste of something bigger, something more powerful, he didn't want to go back to what his life was before. He could only imagine how annoying it's going to be next Tuesday when he gives up the position forever. In all honesty, his new melodramatic attitude about this job was pissing him off. 
Did he somehow forget the fact that he never wanted this in the first place? So what if he doesn't do this kind of thing ever again, or if he never gets another chance to freak out his co-workers by signaling them out in meetings? And so what if Midoriya never gets to be a secretary again? Both of them knew that their roles this week weren't intended to be permanent. So why does he feel so disappointed? What's got you all down in the dump, senpai? Shota was shaken out of a stupor by the cheery voice of Thirteen skipping through the door. Technically, no one could ever know if they were ever really happy, since their black hole body didn't allow them to show any facial expressions, but it was pretty easy to assume. Midoriya must have found Thirteen first in the tea parties he mentioned, meaning that the next person would probably be... Shota's just having an existential crisis now that he's accepted fatherhood. Namuri chimed in, a sly smirk on her face. Okay, first of all, he's always having an existential crisis. That shouldn't be news to anyone in this room. Honestly, the number of times he's contemplated his reason for his pitiful existence on this earth should be concerning. And second, the hell did she mean by fatherhood? Excuse me? Namuri opened her mouth, probably a snarky reply at the ready, but she never got the chance as the door burst open again, drawing all their attention to the remaining staff that just came in. How did Midoriya know about our book club meetings? Cementos whispered to Ectoplasm. Lunch Rush told me about that stunt your student pulled in the cafeteria today. Toshinori, you better thank the gods that you finally taught him how to use his strength without breaking all his bones. Recovery Girl chided, lightly hitting All Might's arm with her purse as he let out a loud choke of blood. Shota cringed. Why is no one addressing how much blood the guy is losing? The guy is a cough away from death at this point. Someone needs to tell him to lay low on stressful activities. He expected the students to not understand, but Recovery Girl. Surely she's discussed this topic with him, right? Unless she has too much on her plate. That's not a good sign for anyone in this building. Is she overworked? Should they? No. Three plans is enough for one day. He'll settle this new development with Midoriya tomorrow. He knows the nurse's office better than anyone at this point, and no doubt has some insider info. Uh, ah, aizawa -kun. Shota broke away from his thought process to stare at the source of the voice. Flat King. The man with sharp canines gave a nervous, wobbly smile as he attempted to give the underground hero a friendly wave. Spoiler alert. It didn't work. Ugh. If that guy says anything rude to him or his student today, he'll... Strangle you with my scarf. Crap. He said that out loud. Hisashi let out an ugly snort and tried to cover it with a cough. Absolutely no one bought it. Vlad flinched with wide eyes and gave a fearful laugh, inching into the farthest corner to go unnoticed. Once again, it didn't work. But it was a pitiful enough effort to get the annoyed teacher to look away and face everyone else in the room. Most importantly, Midoriya, who was currently doing the bouncing thing he did so often as he bounded around the room, handing out the papers, finally pausing to stand next to All Might. Because, of course. As much as I'd rather go through with this by myself, I am required to hold another vote. Immediately, the temperature in the room felt like it had dropped several degrees as a chill went down his co-workers' spines. No one would dare suggest such a thing, but Shota had a feeling it was because they all remember what happened yesterday. None of them wanted to be his or Midoriya's next target to verbally destroy. Quite a shame. That might have been the one thing he was looking forward to. All of you can calm down. It's not as serious as yesterday's course of action. Just a small change that I think everyone would appreciate. He gestured to the paper and watched as they all began to read it over, scanning every line with their eyes. Snipe was the first to speak up. It's a permission slip. But for what? Shoda felt like he could have explained. It was a simple answer, and even with his recent decrease in sleep, it wouldn't have been a hassle for him. But then again, he really liked having the power of choosing not to. Therefore, the black-haired man inwardly smirked as he snapped his fingers and pointed to Midoriya. Cue the ranting. Basically for everything. Off-site training camps for heroics, field trips to labs for support, and visiting hero agencies for business. All of them have the potential to be extremely dangerous. Any student faces the risk of being hurt during those events, and just last year, we got quite a few complaints from parents about not being made aware of our traveling. Therefore, for everyone's peace of mind, it would be better to send out permission slips before the staff randomly ships their students off to these locations. To be honest, I'm not exactly sure why you guys didn't do this in the first place. Shoda nodded. It was such a simple task, yet none of them had ever suggested it to Nezu. His co-workers lowered their heads, and the underground hero watched in amusement as they were chastised by a student. But anyway, as you can see in the third paragraph of the front side, it states that UA is not liable for any items the children lose, any consequences the children might face from the location's employees for their misbehavior, and of course, any injuries they may sustain. However, the paper also says that that doesn't mean the school won't help out. For example, every single member of staff here is certified in medical training, and sometimes even recovered girl joins for extra precautions. 
Midoriya's volume lowered to the same one he used while muttering. But that means there's no actual nurse in the school during those periods of time, which is really bad, actually. Oh, so Shota wasn't exaggerating when he said Recovery Girl was overworked. He finds it hard to believe that everyone, including himself, ever questioned the lack of medical staff in the school. Shizenji's quirk is remarkable, but it's not all-powerful. There are times when her quirk is probably the most unsuited for certain injuries, and if they have no one else to take care of the injured student or hero, then it was a scary thought, to be honest. Oh, and by the way, this applies to in-school events too, such as the sports festival. For support, some general education, and most hero students, it's a good chance to get noticed, but to others, it's like the worst thing ever, and they shouldn't be forced to participate. One reason is that everyone hates a school that forces physical activities. Another reason is that it's useless to business course. And the third reason is that it poses a great risk to those aiming for the underground. Huh. Midori is going off script. Either that or there were actually three pages worth of his speech in his notebook instead of the two pages that Shota saw. Take Tokiyami and Shinso, for example. Last year, Tokiyami's one-on-one -on -one battle with Katam revealed his weakness and sensitivity to light. If any of the villains were watching and paying close attention to him, they'd realize that all they'd need in the future to take him down is a flashlight. For Shinso, his quirk entirely depends on others not knowing how it works, or else it's, once again, useless since all they'd have to do is keep their mouths shut during the duration of the fight, so specific students should also be able to opt out. The jumpsuit-clad teacher suddenly tensed as his mind raced. Why hadn't he thought of those risks before? Shinso, Tokiyami, and even Todoroki had some of their weaknesses and trade secrets exposed at the festival when really it should be kept on the down low was... Was this the same danger he himself had faced in his first sports festival? Back then, the only way for him to get in was to be the center of attention and score first place, no matter how much he hated it. Back then, he didn't have his support items. Everyone could see how his quirk was activated, the side effects of floating hair and the drawbacks of his dry eye. To think that there might have been a villain out there watching and waiting to strike, he needed to take care of this. It's a good point, Snipe pointed out. But the whole purpose of the hero students competing at the sports festival is to show off what they learned to the heroes and agencies. If they don't participate, they won't get noticed, and that'll set them behind, not only for internships, but for work studies later on, too. Students who choose to opt out, and even those who don't, should also be given an ulterior way to show off their skills and potential to heroes and agencies for internships, a way that doesn't involve broadcasting it for the whole world to see. Shota droned, his bored voice contrasting his deeply attentive eyes. They all saw what happened with Momo last year during her fight with Tokiyami. The people watching weren't able to see how useful her quirk was, how she mastered the use of several weapons, and how quick-thinking she was. He wants all of his students to have the best opportunities, so he'll never let something like that risk their careers ever again. Sometime this week, that'll have to be handled, he said to himself, but noting the way Midoriya wrote down every word. Good. Anyway, everyone in favor of permission slips say aye, everyone in opposition say nay, and sleep with one eye open. Once again, it was unanimous. Shota chewed on his pencil as he waited for the final bell of last period to ring deep in thought. Today's lunch scheme had been a success, even better than he had expected. On his way back to the classroom, he'd noticed a few support students making friendly small talk with 2B, and even saw some of his own students making plans with business and gen ed kids to hang out at the mall this weekend. It was all very social. And while that's a great accomplishment on his and his secretary's part, he still doesn't understand how these kids are able to easily talk with each other without awkward silences and dirty glares. He's only able to do that around a few people, like Mike. Once again, Hizashi had told him he'd drive him back home. He'd appreciated the thought, but he didn't know why his friend kept offering if he knew he had paperwork to handle before he left. Not that the underground hero minded, though. It was no trouble to wait a little longer for the guy, but he didn't want the loud blonde to try and rush his work. Speed doesn't equal quality, after all. Huh. That's the same thing Recovery Girl told Tensei back in their second year of UA, after he ended up in her office for the third time that week. Recovery Girl. That reminds him. It seemed that with each new problem they solved, another one popped up in its place. Or rather, three more popped up in its place, judging by the list in Midori's notebook. Shota's not going to lie. He's pretty disappointed in himself and the school board. Everyone in the media painted UA as this golden gate paradise of society, occupied by the brightest minds that are brimming with potential. And while they aren't exactly wrong, they were also pretty ignorant. When you're presented with an establishment that's got such a positive light shown on it, you tend not to question it. 
You take what you get because you know that the moment you look too deep into it, you'll never be able to enjoy it the same way again. And no matter how much he hates to admit it, Shoda fell into that same trap. This whole society turning a blind eye might have been in Yue's favor when it came to public relations and donors, but he knows it won't stay that way for long. He doesn't know who, and he doesn't know when, but someday, someone too curious for their own good is going to come along, and they're going to tear that carefully constructed image to the ground. Shota took the pencil out of his mouth, eyes lifting to stare at Midori as he conversed with his friends. Maybe. Maybe that person is already here. At least, if it's Midoriya, the gruff teacher knows that no matter how far the boy tears it down, he'll put just as much determination into building it back up. Bigger, brighter, and so much better than it was before. And he can't wait for the day when everyone else realizes that, too. Honestly, how hasn't anyone else seen it? It's right there. An incredible mind sitting right under their noses. And that's when it occurred to Shota that Midoriya, in a way, is just like Yue. Hero-worshipping, shining and strong. That's what everyone sees. No one sees what's underneath. He hates this horribly cheesy expression, but that kid is just a happy-go-lucky onion. He's got layers. He thinks he has a pretty good idea of what's underneath, though. Undying loyalty to his friends and family, even a random stranger on the street, that causes him to desperately protect them with his life, ignoring how injured he gets in the process. An insane ability to empathize and understand the struggles of people around him, never downplaying the physical and mental tolls those struggles took on them, and defending them with a passion that almost make you think he was speaking about himself. Finally, a calculating mind to analyze everyone and everything around him. He grasps a good enough understanding of a person's emotional state to accurately determine how to manipulate them into doing what he intends them to do. He notes down the atmosphere, behavior, and the past experiences of a person in order to predict the exact move they'll make next in a fight, and find the best way to take them down because of it. And most importantly, his need to understand the complex workings of any quirk he comes across. Just over an hour ago, Midoriya had asked him questions about his quirk, more questions than anyone else had ever bothered to ask about something so bland and boring as erasure. The kid considered things he'd never even given a second thought to. A minor telekinesis quirk, floating his entire body, being able to wield red light and float objects around him. It all seemed so crazy, but he definitely had the urge to test it all out now. Still, he wondered why the green-haired child felt the need to analyze quirks in the first place. Don't get him wrong, it's a very valuable skill to have as a hero, and one he wishes his other students had too, but that doesn't change the fact that it's a little unusual. Most kids his age, when thinking about becoming heroes, only focused on their own quirks, never anybody else's. Their only concern was getting stronger and punching harder, nothing more, nothing less. And with a quirk like Midoriya's, one that was so eerily similar to All Might's, he would have thought it'd be the same case. The tired teacher sighed, mentally promising himself that he'd ask that question to the boy's face one day. Then a bush of green hair popped up in front of his face, and for the first time in Shota's life, he questioned if Midoriya had a minor psychic quirk, too. Aizawa-sensei! His student cheerfully exclaimed, a megawatt smile on his face that put Kaminari to shame. Problem, child? You know those questions I asked you in the cafeteria? How could he forget? I have another one! Shota's not one to be curious, but... Shoot. He flipped his pencil around his fingers. What would happen if you activated your quirk while staring into a mirror? Shota tensed. He was expecting a wild question, yes, but he didn't know it'd be a question he already had an answer to. Back in high school, Hizashi had dared him to do this exact thing, and the next thing he knew, he had a concussion. Making direct eye contact, a high-pitched whining noise, will gradually increase in volume over the span of five seconds. The mirror will start shaking until eventually it cracks, and finally, a red flash of light will shoot out and give me a concussion. He grumbled out his explanation just to see Midoriya staring at him with wide eyes. That's really specific. And the next thing showed a new. His student had his notebook out and was furiously jotting this new information down. The black-eyed man watched the pencil fly across the page and determined whether or not it would be a good idea to ask his next question. He decided he'll deal with any hypothetical consequences later. Say, problem child. Green eyes lifted to meet his. Why do you analyze quirks? The eyes flashed with an emotion he couldn't determine, but the hesitation told him that the kid was still unsure if he should answer or not. Eventually, he did, much more honestly than Shota expected him to. I was a late bloomer, like, really late. When I was four, I was, uh, falsely diagnosed as quirkless. Oh, that's why he was so adamant about quirkless heroes, but... 
just how late of a bloomer. And everyone told me to give up on trying to be a hero, but I still thought that even without a quirk I could do it. So as soon as I learned how to read and write, I started making hero analysis notebooks. I'd find their weaknesses and strengths so that I could determine a way to exploit or replicate them, either with a support item or with my own brain and fighting skills. I figured that if I didn't have a quirk of my own to work with, I could work against everyone else's. An admirable strategy, one that would most likely work, too, but the phrasing is what made the tired man just a tad bit unsettled, exploiting the heroes' as quirks, working against them. It also sounded very... Yeah, don't get him wrong. It's stupid to suggest Midori would ever consider being a villain. With a heart of gold like that, it's damn near impossible. But just because he wouldn't, doesn't mean he couldn't. Shota knows how the quirkless are treated in this society, even the elderly. They're neglected. Outcasted, abused, anything horrible you can think of is what happens to them. It's almost like having a quirk that's considered villainous, only way worse. At least with a villainous quirk, people know not to mess with you. They consider you dangerous. But no quirk at all. You aren't even good enough to register as a threat. You're nothing. You're worthless. Of course, Shoda knows that's complete crap, but others aren't as bright when it comes to the subject. In any case, that's not the point. The reason there are so many villains is that they felt like they had no other option. Society abandoned them, so they turned to the dark side, a side they knew would never banish them and would welcome them with open arms. If Midoriya hadn't been as selfless and heroic, or maybe hadn't worshipped All Might as much as he did now, and if he had to live the rest of his life being shunned by the rest of the population, then he didn't even want to think about what could have happened. A brain like that, and a strong motive. The world would fall to its knees. But of course, I ended up getting a quirk. The green-haired child chuckled while rubbing the back of his neck, although his voice seemed to have a new edge of sadness to it. So, I guess the analysis was pretty much useless in the end. Hell no. Absolutely not, Shota stated, not even a smidge of uncertainty in his voice. Just because you have a quirk now doesn't mean your analysis notebooks don't have extreme value. If anything, it's your strongest advantage. I suggest you start thinking of it as such. A student looked at him like he'd grown a second head, numbly nodding along to his words. Well, that's progress, at least. I also think you should consider analyzing villains' quirks. That way you can exploit the weaknesses you find in battle. He paused a bit before saying the next part. And maybe try converting your notebooks to an original coded language. You never know who might end up taking a look at the information in there. Right. And just like that, the regular Midoriya was back, writing down his suggestions in his notebook with a look of awe in his eyes. But just when he thought the conversation was over and done with, especially considering the fact that the bell had already rung a few minutes ago, the forest-eyed boy lifted his head. Oh, I forgot to mention the second reason. His teacher nodded his head, signaling for him to elaborate. My dad's also really interested in quirks. He thinks about them even more than I do. He's actually the one that bought me all my notebooks and novels published by famous quirk analyzers. Sometimes he even reads them. If he didn't already have a job, I'd say he was one of those. It was that moment that Midori noticed the empty classroom, face flushing in embarrassment as he realized just how long he'd been talking, yelling out a, Sorry, bye, and sprinting out the door. Shota was left frozen, staring at the spot his student was just standing in. This enigma of a father kept making appearances in his students and his conversations, and the more he learned about him, the more curious he was. A guy with a glare more petrifying than his son's, and an even better analyzer. The man got more terrifying by the second. All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 3 of Throw a Chair Through a Window and Call It a Day. Chapter 4 will be next. I hope you all are still enjoying, and as always, thank you so much for listening.